Welcome to the World of Horror Podcast, episode 109. I'm Mom. And I'm Mac. This is the podcast where we share our love of international horror. Fear is universal, but we are not afraid of subtitles. Wow, house! This week, it's Mom's choice of genre, and I have chosen anthology horror. We reviewed VHS from the U.S. and Three Extremes 2 from Asia. Before we get into it, fair warning, these discussions will include spoilers and language which may not be suitable for all listeners. Let's move on to our first segment, Mom and Mac Chat. Hi, Mac. How's it going? Hi, Mom. You know, it's actually going pretty well. I have great news, which is first, there was like a two or three week period where I kept having to take Branwen to the vet. Part of me thinks that my vet is swindling me because I had to spend uh, <laughs> um, just around $2,000 uh, all oh told, um, which I love her. I would do anything for her. I just don't feel like that was necessary, you know? That seemed a little bit, luckily, you know, I have Alan, so for me it was a thousand, and for him it was a thousand, but that's still too much money um, mm -hmm. for her to be completely fine. There's nothing wrong wow. with her. <laughs> so, yeah, they oh definitely God. held me at gunpoint. Um, some, you know, she did have an ear infection, and she had a bladder infection, and there was a chance that she had cancer, and she was constipated, okay? Ear infection, gone bladder infection gone so that's like that that's because me alan we we did that cancer non-existent which there's been like two times in the past five years that i've paid arm and leg for an ultrasound x-ray for them to be like oh we thought she did but she actually doesn't and i'm like y'all did this like two years ago but you scared me like you like you can't tell somebody mm. your cat could have cancer because it's like well i'll give you anything to to find out if she does or not you tricked me thank god she doesn't it's not like i wanted her to but i just was like okay great 500 dollars, and she doesn't have anything awesome um because she had no symptoms of it except for high calcium but there's like nothing wrong with her okay anyways Right the day after she gets the enema, I have to leave out of the state to go on a business trip, which is like, Alan took great care of her. I had no worries there, but it's like, you want your own eyes on her. You know, it's like, my baby has to go through this thing. I want to be able to watch over her. Um, but actually, it was fine. Alan sent me two pictures every day. He did a great job. And the business trip really wasn't that bad. I really have a great boss. She is the best boss I've ever had. I really feel like it's because she's a woman, partly, um, because and another is that she's not an insane person and uh, she is just a good person. Now, I say the woman part because every other boss I had has been a man. So it just it seems a little bit weird that the first woman I get, she's like the best boss I've ever had. Just saying. <laughs> Never said anything creepy to me. That That's a huge plus. Um, <laughs> but the main thing is, is that I had th this whole business trip. Because I work remotely and most of the team is remote. It used to be an in-office company, but then COVID and then all of her team quit. Which I'm like, I still don't get why they did that because I'm having a ball. Best job I've ever had. But so I had to go there. Everybody went there. There's this whole event that our company was putting on. I don't have anything to do with it. I am truly um, the underground. I am the the underbelly of the business. And I like it that way. And it was this huge expo for the automobile industry, which I could not give less of a fuck about. Um, I do not care, which is fine. When I was interviewing, my boss was like, do you know anything about cars? I said, no, and I don't care to. And she said, that's fine. Same here. So there were all these things to go to. And I was like, God, I'm just going to go and wish I wasn't there the whole time. And so I asked her, I was like, do I have to go to any of this? Because I had to go to this award show. That's fine. I had to meet everybody. Dinners are fine. Whatever. I get that. Um, the whole point is to meet everybody. And then she was like, oh, no, you don't have to go to anything like at all. You don't. Um, there were a few times where she wanted to see me and like get lunch down there. 
I go in and it's like a convention hall filled to the brim with men. No, thank you. And cars. I don't care. So I just went back to my hotel room and that was great. And then I I just was so anxious because it's been over a year since I've been in a business setting in person with people. I had to go get a whole new wardrobe because I didn't have anything really. And um, but she was just so great because there was just a moment where I was in this, you know, awards thing, looking out at all these well-dressed people, just thinking like, I hate it. I hate it here. And she looked at me and she just went, uh, yeah, this business is still full of a lot of old white men, isn't it? You know, just a bunch of them. It's really saturated. And I was like, yeah, it is. <laughs> and <laughs> um, then there was this whole happy hour thing with the whole team in one bar. I don't like crowd spaces. I do not drink. So I did not want to go. And I was like really nervous about it, thinking about it. And then she pulled me aside and was like, you don't have to go. You don't have to go. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable and it's not required of you. And I was like, oh, really? I won't go then. And it was great. And she didn't punish me. My last boss would find me. He'd go to my lab and he'd be like, get upstairs to go to the happy hour. What's the point of going if you don't drink? And also, what's the point of going in general? Like, if I did drink, you know, the last person I'd want to drink with is my boss and my coworkers. Like, what? Um, I don't get it. And I hate that every business, every like corporate thing revolves around drinking. That feels so mm-hmm. dumb. Um, and it's so dumb that you aren't allowed to be like, hey, do we all want to like take an edible together, which I wouldn't want to do anyway. But if I had to pick one, I guess I'd pick that. But that gets you fired. I don't understand. It's so stupid. But anyways, it really wasn't that bad. Uh, I only heard like a few whack comments from my male coworkers, so that's fine. Nobody misgendered me except for wow. one woman. And that one woman used they them. Now here's the thing. You should just ask me if you're like, mm-hmm. I get that there's something going on here, but I don't know what it <laughs> is. You should just ask because they theming is still misgendering me and I don't like it. But if you're a stranger, like if you're a waiter and you're like, I don't know what's going on here, like that's fine. I don't care. But anyways, Nobody in this state, mis- like not even the bar people or the, you know, uh, the waitresses or anything, like they were always like, you gentlemen or sir. And I'd be like, me, which I only say because <laughs> everybody and their mom in, except for my mom, everybody and their mom in North Carolina misgenders me. Like, mm-hmm. I, you know, I can be like, hello, I would like a large Diet Coke. And they'd be like, thank you, ma'am. Here you go. And I'm like, I I have a mustache. Not that women can't have mustaches, but you know what I mean? I grew this. Um, I don't have boobs. Uh, What what more can I do for you people? But hey, in Michigan, they don't care. Or they, or I don't know what it is. Maybe in North Carolina, there's just a lot of women who do look like this. And so they're like, woman, I don't know. Maybe, maybe in North Carolina, you're mostly around women. Because I feel like you, when you and I or you and Quinn and I go out, it's like, hey, ladies. Yeah. And it's, it's just like, and, and it sounds like you were mostly around men except for your boss. That's this true. Thing. That's a good point. Maybe that is it. And then I like I was like, I guess I got to use the men's restroom because in North Carolina, I put on a mask and I use the women's restroom because I'm also it's scary here. So I'm just yeah. like, I... I know the women's restroom. That's where I'm most at home. It's cleaner. I don't understand the whole urinal thing. It was so weird walking into a room, seeing the back of a coworker and being like, his penis is out. (laughs) If I like turn the corner, I'll see it with my eyes. Why do y'all do that? Why do y'all like, it's so weird. I mean, usually there are like, there There are barriers, right? That's not enough of a barrier for me. Even weirder are like the troughs that sometimes, oh. I, which I have not, you know, encountered I've never myself. seen with my eyes. Yet. I've heard, I've heard tell, you know, like, uh, like at sporting events or you know places where there's just a ton of people. And there's just like a trough in the middle of the room. No thing. I guess that is a thing men would think of, though. Again, no offense to any men listening, but that does sound like I feel like the reason why that doesn't exist for women is because women are like, of course not. Why would I do that? But men are like, yeah, sure. Go to the piss drop. That's fine. Um, 
<laughs> so yeah, I I used that there. It was great. Mm -hmm. I love not being misgendered, though. It's such an unusual thing for me that I was like, it almost made me uncomfortable because I was like, oh, mm -hmm. I gotta I gotta really act like a man now. Though I don't because they thought I was a man before when I just was like, oh, they're gonna think I'm a woman. So I, anyways, thanks, Michigan. Um, really wasn't that bad. Came back home, took everyone back to the vet, thought she was constipated again. They were like, no, she's fine. And she doesn't have any infections. So she's actually like the prime specimen that a cat could be at 16 years old. So everything's coming up Mac now. The past two... Oh, did I tell you I saw a mouse in my house? Mm -mm. The same day no. you came over, the night before my birthday, I saw a mouse in my house. And um, no offense to mice, and I'm sorry, <laughs> PETA, but we poisoned that mouse. I did not find oh. the body, but... Listen, I don't want any yeah. flack from this. It's in my house. And if you would kill an ant, it's the same thing in my... It might be a mammal, but it's still a pest. And so I said this to some friends and they looked at me with shock and horror. I'm like, I'm not shocked. What am I going to do if I catch it? I, I don't... I guess let it out, but I don't know. Like, anyways, I don't think it's a bad thing to poison a mouse. <laughs> I had, uh, yeah, I, I had this really old timey when Sammy was little. Um, I, I lived in the worst apartment, um, that mm. I've ever lived in, but I just had to get out of my mom's house. So, um, I kind of like just took it, but there were all kinds of problems with this place, but it had one of those old timey, I don't know if you've ever seen these. This was the only time I encountered it. It was a stove, but it had a, a, a this like door that like lifted up. So oh. you could get to the burners and stuff. Weird. Um, I mean, so I guess like for a really small space, it made sense, you know. But anyway, so one morning I go to make eggs or whatever, and I lifted up the lid and there was this little mouse like curled among the coil, you know, in this uh, stovetop. Oh. And I was, I was like livid. I was like, "How dare you!" That's how I felt. You know? Yeah, I know it's crazy. And I had a cat. I had a cat living with me. Um, and then I also was like this. I was very conflicted. So I let, I let it. I caught it and I let it, let it out. Then of course it just got back in again. I mean, so I, I feel you. It's a, it, but I, I was surprised at myself at how like angry I was at this invader to right? my space. <laughs> I loved yeah. Ratatouille. So, you know, you'd <laughs> think you'd be like, no, I'm cool with it. I, Actually, this experience, I don't think I'll ever see Ratatouille the same way again. If I was that guy at the end of the movie and they were like, look who made it. I'd be like, this place needs to be condemned, burned to the ground. I hate, sorry, I, I thought I liked the meal. I don't. Um, that's an unrealistic <laughs> film. I don't care if they wash their little hands. Um, they're still disgusting creatures. You know how many diseases they have? They spread the Black Plague. Sorry, mice. Sorry, okay. rats. It was, it was the fleas. On that was the on rats. the ma rats. <laughs> how am I supposed to know ratatouille rats don't have that on them? <laughs> they never talk about that in the movie. <laughs> what about raccoonie? A raccoon? Yeah, raccoonie from from everything everywhere. All at oh, once. he's like cool. Yeah, yeah, he's cool. If he made your meal, would you feel happy with that? I think I, I think I'd feel happier, honestly. If one raccoon made my meal, other than a kitchen full of rats, that's fine. <laughs> I think I could actually handle that because whenever I see a, a raccoon on my backpack, I saw it once. I was delighted. I was like, I heard a rustling. I got so scared. Is there an intruder? I look outside. Two raccoons. Go right ahead, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Because they weren't in my house. I, I got you. Yes. Yeah. So anyways, I like, I like it was raccoons. not. What? I like raccoons, but there seems to be a trend. Maybe people have always had raccoons as pets. And I'm oh. just like jumping on the um, Instagram reels raccoon algorithm train. But um, my boyfriend and I send each other cute animal vids back and forth and so many people have raccoons as pets and we're both like when did this start i don't feel like that should be a thing mm -hmm. just to me uh i th I feel like it should be like a squirrel with a broken foot kind of thing like you nursed right. it back to health but 
Because also them things are usually fat as hell. There's no way that can be good for them. Like I saw a video of this guy like my raccoon rates different flavors of Cheetos. Don't feed. We shouldn't feed humans Cheetos. Don't feed a raccoon Cheetos. Like if then like, you know, raccoon in the wild, they eat trash. Should then the whole point not be, okay, you own one, you feed it good food. Like that'd be like, I saved this cat. I'm going to keep feeding it like like disgusting fish you know like no we take care of that animal um so yeah no that doesn't seem right or good you know i wouldn't mind you know i have this weird i have i have multiple futures you know mapped out for myself of Um, course and one of them of course is i have a sanctuary uh animal sanctuary I don't know who's running the thing. It's not me. I'm just there to enjoy <laughs> the animals because I have no skills in terms of like veterinary science oh, yeah. or anything like that. Um, but yeah, there are like goats. Oh my God, I love a goat. Me too. And um, I really want to get a hug from, you know, a goose or something. And um, I really want a cow to lay down in my lap. And then, you know, I can die happy because, but yeah, I, I'll need a whole staff. Yeah. You know to take care of them and some raccoons could come and chill yeah. outside yeah not indoors no i mean i wouldn't want a goat indoors either it's no no offense to the goat i wouldn't want a pig i do i'll take indoors? that pig inside if you can yeah. clean them um one last thing is then the day after my birthday i'm like let yeah. me hop into my car go see my father oh what is that a wasp's nest in my car Whoa. What? Thankfully, I, I have a wonderful boyfriend. I immediately just run in. There's a wasp nest in my car. And he took care of it, like, full of wasps. Um, It was in, not to freak you out, but it was in the passenger side door. Oh, wait, you didn't go in my car anyway. Not to, who would be freaked out? Uh, no, you did. I think you were in my car. Yes, um, you drove. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that wasp nest was definitely there the whole time. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, I kind of had a little breakdown moment because I was like, not safe in my house. I got mice in my house. Oh, not yeah. safe in my car. Uh, the world is scary. Uh, just like sobbing. So, but everything's yeah. fine now. I think I got over it. That's good. So did Alan, you know, like spray it? Like, <laughs> No, we did kind of a North Carolina style. He grabbed the dustpan, scraped it out and stomped on it. Wow. No one got hurt. That's good that no one got hurt. Yeah. Yeah, th- those fuckers, man, they are they are very uh, cagey. I don't know how I don't it's not like I leave my car doors open or windows. Yeah. So where was it exactly? In, In the, the door? passenger door like cuz I noticed there was some plastic coming off or something, so I went I didn't even I it's kind of a miracle I did find it. Um so then I opened up the door and then like in the crevice between like where all the kind of guts of the door go, like yeah. the hinges, it was just sitting there. Oh, wow. How did it get in there? I don't know. Huh. It freaked me out. Um, but everything's fine now because the business trip's over. Branwyn's not sick and uh, everything's fine. The mouse and the wasps are dispatched. We, I don't know if the mouse is dead, but the bait was eaten and we have mm-hmm. seen no poop since. So, okay. yeah, probably. probably just crawled somewhere to die. Yeah. Yeah. Which, sorry. Nice. Um, Did you have a good birthday? I mean, actually, I already asked you this question. You said no, so I'm sorry. Like, we can cut that. Cut that <laughs> no, cut it's that. fine. Yeah, no, it wasn't very good. But Alan got me a lot of sweet presents. He really did his best. So with he was he was dealt a difficult hand of me already having kind of the worst weekend ever. But he did great. Uh, we'll, we'll get him next time. <laughs> we'll, we'll get a good birthday next time. Didn't happen this year. 27, not off to a good start. Oh, what? I'm already feeling weird about being 27. I know there's people who are older, but hey, for me, it feels like that's an old age. And then I was online and I saw somebody made 
art of these two characters, one who's 28 and one who's 30, and they typed in the tags, I love old men, and that sent me into orbit. I was like, old men? (laughs) Am I old? (laughs) I'll tell you one thing. I, I took a I, I'll t- I took a trip with some new friends, um, the one that you unfortunately could not attend. Um, but it turned out okay because um, Quinn also bailed, and then that meant that it was um, this married couple and um, and their niece who's Aww. fifteen. So um, and I just got to know these folks, you know, a little better than than I had, and we were kind of just like. Uh, fogged in to this like ski resort type cabin so we're way up in the clouds literally and um we couldn't see much for the first like day and a half and then we went shopping um at an antique store which is fine for about i don't know say 20 25 minutes and then you start to feel like this shit is fucking haunted in here and you got to get out but um anyway being around a 15 year old um, it was pretty cool. And I, as a joke, I was like, I really want somebody to help me promote my podcast, you know, because we have a bunch of um, clips of video. And anyway, there's a bunch of stuff, but I would have to teach myself how to do it. And I'm like, I should just hire, you know, this girl. And, and I think she's somewhat interested because then Ooh. like the next day she started following you know, the account on Instagram. So we'll see what happens. Um, I don't know how you hire a 15 year old since I I don't know if 15 year olds can work legally, (laughs) but, um, and I don't want to break any laws. Um, but I, I, uh, it'd be like a babysitter, like under the table kind of thing. Like, I think so. Yeah. I I will have to look up child labor laws in North Carolina. Of course they're pretty flexible, I guess at this point in American history. So, yeah. Um, I just don't want to be getting easier and easier to get, uh, you know, cheap labor. But like I told you, I learned that like, cis is just sort of a label for like basic hetero i again i don't think that's correct i know i've never heard that from anybody else on the planet ever it's what the teenagers are are using i I, they they can be wrong people are always like they can be i know they can be wrong but also the teenagers all queer which is cool yeah not always true not all not all not all but i'm just saying um, in this friend group, it seems to be like everybody is is queer, and if they're not queer, they're cool with queer people. Like, yeah. like it's not an issue at all. Yeah. For the record, so I do nice. believe it's cis het because that's like not only are you cis, but you're heterosexual. I know that's what I said because I had already made a bunch of references that I am heterosexual, but I said, but you don't know. I am cis, but you don't know. I could be a lesbian. I could be pan. And, and she was like, but you're cis. Meaning <laughs> I'm just a boring, <laughs> cis hat person. You got nothing but going I'm like, on. I mean, everybody in this, like everybody on the camp, on the camping trip, on the trip. Yeah. Was queer, queer except way. me. Yeah. But I'm like story of my life, you know? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> 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 well, I, was, <laughs> I I'm basically the only straight person in my family, so except for the straight man, who my brother and my son. Mm-hmm. But the me- the the women out of the women, out of all the, you're the odd out, out of all the women, yeah, out of all the the women in my family, I'm the only straight one. But that's okay that's because an you're the accepting way to one. Because you said either they're queer or they're cool with it. Yeah. You're cool with it. Anyway, let's get into this long ass show. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. So normally, Wohos, we would go with the older movie first, which is Three Extremes 2, but there's so much to talk about with V slash H slash S from 2012 that I asked Mac if he would go first. And I said, sure. <laughs> Which was really convenient because if he said "hail no," hail no, we um, have a problem. So, 
So let's get into VHS V slash H slash S. First off, when I was when I first saw this movie, I thought this is a great movie. And now at the ripe age of 27, I said, this movie fucking sucks. I hate it. So let's get into it. Every story is exactly the same. Every story involves a woman getting hurt in some way or being the the cruel one. Um, so there's that. Um, okay. VHS. A POV found footage horror film from the perspective of America's top genre filmmakers. A group of misfits are hired by an unknown third party to burglarize a desolate house in the countryside and acquire a rare tape. Upon searching the house, the guys are confronted with a dead body, a hub of old televisions, and an endless supply of cryptic footage, each video stranger than the last. So since this is an anthology, we've got a bunch of different directors. Maybe I'll go through like not to overwhelm, I'll just go through each one and give the details first. So let's start off with Tape 56. Tape 56 was directed by Adam Wingard, who also directed Your Next. It stars Galvin, Calvin Reeder as Gary, Lane Hughes as Zach, Kentucky Audley as Rox, Adam Wingard as Brad, Frank Stack as Old Man, Sarah Byrne as Abby, Melissa Boatwright as Tabitha, Simon Barrett as Steve, and Andrew Dawes Palermo as fifth thug. <laughs> so Kentucker Oddly was also in Sacrament. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So it seems like there's a lot of crisscross. I mean, it seems like all these fellas kind of know each other. Ty West and Adam Wingard and um, and these fellas. So, but I just recognize that name because it's so unusual. Yeah. The whole movie was released January 22nd, 2012 at Sundance and October 5th, 2012 in the U.S. and has a runtime of 116 minutes. So since the film is presented as an anthology, what's common with a lot of them is that they're built into a frame narrative, which acts as its own horror film. Each short film is linked together with the concept of found footage, with every segment being one of the VHS tapes. Um, here's a great thing about this one is that the overarching narrative sucks just as bad as the rest of them. The frame narrative focuses on a criminal gang who film their exploits, which include a few things like smashing the walls. Quick note, if it's a VHS tape, why are there so many jump cuts of them smashing things? It's like one cut right after the other. You're telling me these men are amazing at editing and they got to stop the film each time and start it up immediately when they're about to smash something. Makes no damn sense. <laughs> so they go into random houses and smash everything. It literally begins with them attacking a couple, grabbing a woman, lifting her shirt and bra up and just exposing her breasts as she screams, stop, please stop. Awesome intro to your film. I really want to watch it now. And they're watching it back and they're like, yeah, we pit she had great tits. Yeah, love the tits on this one. Interstitched is uh, a guy who secretly filmed himself having sex with someone classy. And at one point he's like, oh, which tape did you use? Oh, no, they taped over me, um, you know, taping a woman against her will. That's awesome. Um, so an anonymous source offers them a large sum of money to break into a house and steal a single VHS tape. The gang accept the task, eager to expand their criminal enterprises. This is one of those movies where it shows a lot of people traveling instead of like, I think a lot of found footage horror thinks that you need a bunch of, sorry, thinks you need a bunch of boring scenes to make it seem realistic. I don't agree. I think it just makes your movie pretty tedious. So we have a lot of shots of them acting like assholes going to this thing. Like none of them are likable. So they enter the house and they find a corpse of an old man. They don't ever bother checking his pulse because why would you do that if you thought he was dead? Um, they're just like, that guy's dead. He looks like he's sleeping. Um, so they all go look for stuff and they leave one guy. They're like, yeah, just stay down here and watch the tapes. Why? Um, so they roam the house and Brad stays behind and he just <laughs> picks one up because that's what you do. So then we start off with the next film about taping women against their will. Amateur Night. 
this this apparently has a spinoff called Siren from 2016. That's probably just as bad. It was directed by David Bruckner and written by David Bruckner and Nicholas Tikoski. Tikoski, excuse me. The characters Shane, Patrick, and Clint are three friends who've rented a hotel room to fulfill Shane's intent of bringing women back for sex. They make Clint the nerdiest one, wear glasses that have been outfitted with a hidden camera and microphone that will allow them to turn their planned encounter into an amateur porn video. Awesome! So they begin bar hopping. Um, You know, they're right behind these two women walking and very loudly one of them's like, she's got a great ass, let's go for that one, as if they're hunting, you know, deer for sport. Clint encounters Lily, a young woman, which I did like this detail. She has like a very tiny, barely noticeable scar, like right through the front of her face. She's got these huge eyes and definitely looks like, I guess if you were them, you just think she's on something, but she's very bizarre. Mm. Um, I think she's the best actress in the whole thing. Um, and so Clint encounters her. He can't get with any other one. So he's, you know, sticking onto this weirdo who's very unusual and just says, I like you. Um, <laughs> and he's so desperate that I guess that's not weird. <laughs> if some bug eyed freak walked up to me and was like, I like you. I'd be like, I don't like this. Goodbye. Um, so in addition to picking up Lily, they also succeed somehow in convincing <laughs> another young woman, Lisa, to return to their motel room. There's a great scene um, as they're in the car. And this, it, what was so unsettling about this movie was not the horror element. It was how realistic this felt to what could have been a very real experience from a woman, which makes me, I'm not trying to say anything. I'm not trying to make any accusations. But if this is the movie that you want to make, I'm suspicious of you. I'm suspicious in how you view women. I'm suspicious about the things that you've done in your past to so lovingly craft a film that feels so realistic to a woman being taken, not knowing what she's getting herself into and getting assaulted. Um, I'm angry because this film made me so angry. I don't remember it being like this, but it's so disgusting and I wouldn't recommend anyone to watch it. Anyways, while they're in the car, they're just laughing about this girl who seems so uncomfortable. They make her take some cocaine. That's so weird. So as they get back to the motel room, Lisa passes out and the guy that's kind of the ringleader still attempts to have sex with her. And it takes a guy on the couch who's not doing anything. He's like, I'm just sitting here, man. They're all drunk off their asses. And he's like, Oh, no, man, she's passed out. Like, trying to, I guess, salvage some sense of class. Um, They're like, no, she's passed out. That's like, what, statutory rape? He's still trying to get at her. And then he seems so, like, ugh, like, like, frustrated. And I hate that attitude from men as if, like, that sex with a woman is something that you're owed, you know? Oh, I gave mm-hmm. drinks to this bitch all night. Now she's going to pass out on me. That's, like, a very real thing that men think. Not all men, but... A fair number enough to make it concerning so lily continues to awkwardly come on to clint but he's kind of having a little bit like this is too much for him he's the only one that he doesn't seem like a good one but the only one with sense maybe so then shane on the couch or no shane who tried to um rape a woman uh comes on to her instead again very weird because she just seems like she's freaked out uh, Clint notices that Lily's feet are clawed and have scales as he undresses her. He just straight up rips her dress off. No underwear or anything. So we get more boobs because that's what we need. Um, Shane and Patrick don't really realize. Lily appears responsive, then pushing Shane onto his back and beginning to undress Clint. Um, and then the guy, the third guy, Patrick, you know, just so creepy. He just gets up without saying any, anything and starts to undress too, like he's going to join. It just was so upsetting. So overwhelmed, Clint goes to the bathroom. Um, Patrick, you know, is disrobing. Um, But Lily makes it clear that she does not like Patrick. And yet he continues. Moments later, um, while Clint's in the bathroom trying to, you know, 
take himself back together, Patrick bursts into the bathroom with a large cut on his head, completely naked, and claims that Lily bit him and shows this like pretty gnarly looking bite on his hand. Or sorry, large cut on his hand, not his head. When they go back in uh, outside and approach Shane, <laughs> kind of funny, Patrick like broke off the like shower hand bar <laughs> yeah. or something and is just holding it up naked. <laughs> um hey listen there's something for everybody there was a little bit of cock and balls um great so clinton patrick when they approach shane lily suddenly sprouts fangs and attacks and kills shane clinton patrick then go back to the bathroom patrick still nude oh excuse me arms himself with a shower rod returns to the room clint then tries to wake up lisa so that they can escape together as patrick attempts to fight lily but she has subdues him pounces on him drinks his blood and rips off his penis. Um good, I guess. I don't know. I don't enjoy any of this. Clinton <laughs> escapes the room, falls down the stairwell and has the gnarliest break in his wrist of all time. Has anybody broken their wrist in such a horrible way from just falling down the stairs? Oh, probably. It like the it's a compound fracture. I it just felt like another moment of wouldn't this be gross? So, Lily catches up to Clint her face has now been split apart. This is the only cool part. Again, that scar in the beginning now makes sense as her face is like split apart and she's like this demonic vampire thing. Um, instead of attacking him, though, she tries to suck his dick. Um, he doesn't want that, of course. So he rejects her. She starts to cry, but then begins to growl. He flees. And again, I do like this scene. He's like begging people to help him. And they're all like kind of behind, like the motel people are behind that that common window that they have. And they're just like, what the fuck? And other people don't really know what's going on, but he's begging them to help him. Um, but then we just see him go up into the sky, like again, just from his POV and look up and she's got wings and is carrying him. And so she is a succubus and the glasses then fall off Clint's face as Lily carries him away. And we just see kind of people in the background like, what the fuck just happened? So that half of it, the last yeah. two seconds are great. Um, yeah. <laughs> if they just didn't have um, the date rape, I think it would be a very good short film. But the whole point of so many of these things is partly like, let's secretly film someone. And, oh, there's a twist. Either the woman, it's usually the woman is bad. So not only are we like assaulting them, but they're also all secretly evil. Do they well, hate women? I think that's a question that we could ask. But I feel like, and I didn't, I think it was in the, I don't know when it was. I watched all of these when the last VHS came out. And I feel like there's a very similar one in another movie, which is much more recent. I mean, you know, yeah. this is, you could maybe excuse it. You can't, but I mean, you could maybe excuse it. It was 11 years ago, you know, but um, th this just, this does seem to be a theme, this kind of like predatory men acting as predators and then getting their come up and sort of. But it doesn't but not, feel good. Like, no, it, it does not. It feels, it doesn't feel like they feel more like victims and there doesn't mm -hmm. really ever seem because the women still have no agency in anything. Um, and I just feel like here's a w crazy opinion. You can definitely have a found footage horror that doesn't involve secretly filming women as you uh, either date rape them or um, have sex with them, which even still doing it against them knowing that they're being filmed is like. A disgusting act in itself you, and the fact that this was the only thing that they could think of to do is just like you're dumb i don't like you and you shouldn't make movies anymore well, and go to I, therapy I do, I do i do feel like as as the series goes on it does get a little more creative but even in we'll get to it but even in ty west's um movie there's there's a sense of coercion and toxicity and i was just like what because i think they did this kind of independently of each other you yeah. know so I, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering what was going on i mean like i said they, these were all guys in their late 20s early 30s when they made these short films 
I don't know. And I'm trying to think of what kind of was going on in the culture in 2012. And I don't know if it's, you know, that we're just so dumb that it's like, oh, wow, we can put things on film. What, how should, what should we do with that? Well, we got to trick women (laughs) so we can see some boobies. Um, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of something that's redeeming about this or something that helps to reveal something about the culture. I don't know, but I, I do feel like, I mean, as soon as we got, you know, cameras on our phones, guys are sending pictures of their dicks to people. So I, we're, we're just a very limited species. We just don't have. Yeah. A lot of imagination, I guess. I do feel like this this did make sense at the time in a way. Like again, not because I'm excusing it, but growing up for me, there was a like I feel like I feel like I see, saw so many movies, comedy and horror alike, that just had this sense of we're just guys being dudes and we like fucking chicks. And a lot mm-hmm. of things about like this guy's a nerd but somehow he got the hottest fucking chick and she showed his tits to him and she's a stupid bitch like that was every movie i think like it like i i don't know one i'm just thinking of is like wedding crashers of like this stupid crazy bitch wants to fuck me and she's got big hot tits like that's just how as so many movies felt and so it felt normal like watching this i mean true i was very young at the time so maybe it also was just like i don't realize this stuff but you'd think as at the time me being a young girl i would have been like wow this is crazy but i liked this movie so i I know i feel like that was that maybe is a little bit indicative that's like well this is nothing wrong every movie's like this which is scary i'm so glad that's not or less of the case now and just jesus christ it was like one whammy after the other. And I was just like, how could I have ever liked this movie? Um, yeah. So, And I don't know if it's the frame or if, sorry, I don't know if it's the frame or if it's an amateur night, but somebody talks about upskirt, you know, shots. Yes. I think it, I think it might be the frame. It is. Um, yeah. They're just trying to figure out like what else they can do to make money, you, you know, I guess. But um, I'm just like, that is one of the most disturbing. I just got sick. I don't know. It's all disturbing, but just the idea that like the lengths that people go to, to get like an upskirt shot. Yeah. Like in, in toilets or like just, I don't know, just wherever. And I'm just like, what the fuck is fucking wrong with people that this is how you're going to use your energy. Yeah. Like that you're owed just by women existing, like you're yes. owed a piece of their body. Like it, it even is present when people are like, I don't like the way this woman looks. I don't like the way she's dressed. Oh, she, you know, she used to be hot. You're not owed a single thing. Like you're not owed thinking that she looks hot. You're not owed her body. You're not owed what you believe is like the best version of her. Can you just see them as people, please? Like, can we just? Oh, that's uh, no, I guess not. I guess they're just Apparently not. even, you know, even if it's against their will, we are owed every piece of their body and should be able to sell it to other nasty men. I mean, again, that's why I'm suspicious of these guys that that's I see it would never, ever even occur to me to uh, make a movie like this. So the fact that it occurred to you and you were like, this is a great idea is like. What's wrong with you? I mean, and these are really high respect, highly respected um, directors. You know, I mean, I really love Your Next. It's, pro- it's probably one of my favorite movies. The guy who did the um, Amateur Night did Ritual, which I know you weren't a, the Ritual, which I know you weren't a huge fan of. But I think there are elements in that movie that are very inventive. And he also did the Night House. Again, I wasn't a huge fan of that one, but there were some. There was one shot that actually you know, scared me. So, I mean, I think these are talents and then I I haven't heard anybody sort of disavow themselves from, from this, this project. Um, I, a lot of people in the letterbox 
you know, we're, we're quite upset, you know, by this yeah. film. But, well, yeah. Mm-hmm. On to the next one. <laughs> the next one is Second Honeymoon, directed by Ty West, written by Ty West. Though there is like a little bit of element, I maybe then by the end it makes sense. I would say this is like one of my favorite ones out of this. I think mm-hmm. it is a little bit of a standout in how not disgusting it is. Um and how how creepy it is, but not in a uh men men in their uh, views towards women scare me more in like a, oh this is just creepy <laughs> so right. good job ty west for not making <laughs> me hate you um so we begin with sam and stephanie who are a married couple traveling to arizona for their honeymoon with stephanie recording and documenting everything along the way first off these people feel like real people which is really wild in this movie um they feel cute it feels like a true a cute couple going around not just being like oh babe you're so funny but like making little stupid jokes to each other and just having fun um i really liked the vibes and what i said before about boring parts this is how you do context in a found footage movie without making it excruciating to watch like i was enjoying just watching them you know I wasn't even thinking, where's the horror? Please give it to me. I just was like, wow, this is cute. I like this. Um, That night, they visit a Wild West-themed attraction known as the Wild West Junction, where Stephanie receives a prediction from a mechanical fortune teller dressed as a prospector. The prediction claims that she will soon be happily reunited with a loved one, and that she is also very trusting and easily taken advantage of. Sometime later, while they're in their motel room, a strange woman comes to Sam and Stephanie's room and awkwardly tries to convince Sam off camera to give her a ride somewhere the next day. And then we see a little view of the parking lot and just see kind of like a black figure walking by. And Sam is visibly shaken. Like Stephanie's asking, Hey, like what happened? And he's like, I I don't know. I just, you know, and she asks, should we call somebody to help her? He's like, no, you know, it's, it's fine. It's which was interesting. Like, why is he so shaken by this? And it, and in this case, you just see this sort of strange person just sort of milling around outside in the, I mean, it seems realistic. It seems like that could happen. Yeah. And that stuff um, is just kind of creepy and scary. Yeah. Like, what do you do? Yeah. Cause you also, if somebody's really in need, it's like, I want to be a nice person, but mm-hmm. I don't know. And, uh, there is this little moment. This is the stuff I don't like, which yeah. is before she goes to before they go to sleep, you know, Sam's got the camera. And while Stephanie's taking off her shirt, he's like, hey, turn around. You know, how about you take more off and just keeps pressuring her to have sex on camera. And she very clearly says, like, I don't want to do that. I'll make out with you and have sex off camera, but I do not want to do this. And he keeps pressuring her. But then I guess by the end, this does make a little bit more sense. Um, Or I don't know. So she does not act like she kind of makes out a little bit with him. But, you know, it doesn't go anywhere. And again, I was just like, come on again. But anyways, here's the true scary part. In the middle of the night while they're asleep, we see somebody, you know, again, just from the POV of the camera. Um turn on the camera and it has a little bit of a light and they break into the room and they, you know, lower the cover over Stephanie and uh, she's wearing, you know, a little piece of underwear and this person takes off, takes like a switchblade and just runs it against her butt. Very scary. Yeah. Um, This is one of my biggest fears that someone would like break into my house and observe me sleeping and film it and then i would know that they had been there and i had been oblivious yeah (sighs) you'd never feel safe again no we also see them steal a hundred dollars from sam's wallet and takes his toothbrush and (laughs) just dips it in the toilet and i liked this too is if it it did not feel like some evil mastermind it just felt like a creep you know just some creep who's just it's kind of childish in a way too of like, oh, mm-hmm. it's gonna take your toothbrush and steal your money. And I liked that. The next day we see Sam 
brushing his teeth. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they go to the Grand Canyon. He notices that the money's missing and accuses Stephanie of taking it. And she's very clearly like, oh, what do you mean? I didn't take it. And he just goes, wouldn't be the first time. Um, okay. Uh, but everything's fine. They go to the Grand Canyon and just have a jolly old time. So the next night, we see the stranger enter the room again, lift off the covers, this time of Sam, take the knife, and they just immediately start stabbing him in the neck. And it's so scary. Because yeah. that would be... I mean, like, you're dead if that happens anyway, but that would be just so horrible. Not being so vulnerable. Yeah. Like, when we sleep, we're so prone and vulnerable. And then to not even know what's going on. Oh, it's so scary. And it's a very gruesome scene. Like, he's choking on blood and just, ugh. So then we see the killer, you know, take the switchblade and clean it off. And it's a woman wearing a porcelain mask. And uh, they take off. There's another woman there, and it's revealed that it's Stephanie. They begin pay making out passionately, and then it cuts to Stephanie and her lover driving away, with Stephanie asking if she erased the footage. So I guess it makes the filming, like him pressuring her, make a little bit of sense. Like, you know, maybe this is an asshole dude. I mean, he is an asshole by, like, you know... I mean, she did technically steal it, but... You know, him being like, well, it wouldn't be the first time you took my money. Like, a married couple shouldn't be talking to each other like that. Right. That's what I mean. That's what I like. It's like, they seem like a cute couple, but obviously there's tension, you know, in the relationship. And I would say that if somebody in any relationship says, listen, I don't want to do this thing that you're asking me to do. And you're like, come on. That's yes, a problem. Do. Yeah. It's so, nasty. Yeah, I mean, but I don't know about the ending though. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't love the ending. I think this is one of the the scariest. You know, I, I think the part with the filming and stuff is super scary, and obviously his murder is super scary. But I don't, I don't know how I feel about the ending. Same. But. It it, it kind of ties into the VHS theme of. Um, women be crazy and uh they're like women are and usually scary. the villain at the end of this of these movies right and and i i don't know about you did you assume that the the filmer was male i did i did so too it'd be a cool sub i don't mind the subversion that it was a woman but then to be like these lesbians like yeah, I don't know. The, your only gay characters are murderers. Okay, cool. Like, because even though it's really disgusting to pressure your partner, is it deserving of murder? I would not say it is, personally. Um, you're kind of a bad person if you kill some. Like, just break up. Just, br just that's, break up that's with him. That's that, too. I mean, I, I, think his, I think his behavior is absolutely offensive and unacceptable. But likewise, I would not want to be with a murderer. Yeah, I would. That's not unacceptable. Want to, yeah, to stab somebody in the middle of the night—that's pretty. And if even if it was my 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 lover, to then find find out that she was stroking my butt with a knife while I didn't know—that's gross too. That's also totally. against my will. So everyone's <sighs> bad here. <laughs> yeah, we have no winners here in this one. Yeah, so Ty West, not your best work, but even though this is an exceptionally low bar, it probably is the best one of this set. Or one of the best. I kind of I like the last one, but we'll, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Back into the frame story, Rox is left confused by what he just witnessed. Unknown to him, however, the old man's corpse has disappeared. I do like this. I am like, how did you not notice? And you know it's coming. When a guy sits down with his back to an old man in a chair, you're like, okay, so he's going, he's not dead. All right. And then it happens. You're like, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's something back in the basement. The other criminals debate on why the tape they're after is so special and also plan to make copies of it so they can make some extra money. And the film then transitions to the next tape. Tuesday, the 17th, directed by Glenn McQuaid and written by Glenn McQuaid. There's a group of 20-somethings, Joey, Spider, and Samantha, 
and they accompany their new friend, Wendy, on her annual trip to a lake located in a nearby forest. Can I say, this one might be my favorite. It's oh, really? cheesy, but I love mm-hmm. the effect. And I do like stupid slashers full of dumb characters who get killed. It's just a personal, I, I don't know, I like it. And I think this does this pretty well, you know? There's still yeah. some nastiness from the men but the women give it back as much and i like oh, at least yeah. there's some some of that you know and the effect is kind of cool because you could only get this effect on vhs yeah so i think that's kind of cool yeah so that this one i i feel like people might think this one's dumb all of them are dumb so i think this one does its stupidness in a very good way that's entertaining So, you know, they're driving in this car. Joey films the group as Wendy leads them through the woods, who occasionally mentions some accidents that took place or and not just place, but the lives of her friend. I forgot to mention, actually, before they get to the forest, there's a scene that, again, I I really like where uh, so kind of the vibe of all the characters is Joey is just kind of like your regular run of the mill dude. I like this is a cute guy, you know. Um, he's nice. Spider's this little dorky guy. Samantha's, you know, a very pretty girl who's got makeup on. And Wendy, you know, just has wearing like, you know, regular clothes. And there's a moment while they're driving that Samantha's like, you know, Wendy, you told me this was going to be a girl's trip. You know, who are these guys? And they all kind of say, yeah, you all told me it was just going to be me. And she's like, oh, well, you know, I just needed all of you to come here. And it's just like kind of weird, but not enough to be like, oh, get me out of here yet. Um, just and they all just kind of treat it like that's weird that you did that. <laughs> 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 um, one of the moments where Wendy again is kind of creepy is there. She's like, oh, hold on. Can you film this over here? And there's just this, this kind of like mossy stone thing. She's like, yeah, I, I had a friend who like had an accident. Um and Joey's like, whoa, like what happened? She's like, yeah, she actually like fell off and hurt her head here. Anyways, <laughs> just kind of, <laughs> okay. They kind of don't know if she's fucking with them or not. And so when the camera scans certain areas, there's glitch, like like in that area, there's glitched images of mutilated bodies. I Even though this is like, how would this happen? You know, it's cool. I like it. It it adds to this like oh like this this sense of dread that you have building up. Um, they also discovered the mutilated corpse of a pig, and uh, you know Joey and Spider mm-hmm. are kind of two dipshits, but I it I think this makes more sense. Like Joey eats a bug at one point, and Spider's like, "Ooh, that's so gross!" You know, it feels more like childish fun, um, and they just feel less like stupid assholes. Like they're stupid, but they're just kind of having fun. And, you know, Spider talks about, like, yeah, I came because, you know, I wanted to get with Samantha and stuff. And, and you know, Samantha will hear that and be like, I'll never fuck you, ever. You're an idiot. So at least they get to have some agency of being like, ew, shut the fuck up. So shortly before, <laughs> and while they're, you know, playing with this corpse, they begin to leave. And Wendy just turns around and goes, you know, you're all going to die here. <laughs> <laughs> walks away <laughs> but again it's kind of like is this weird girl just messing with us um so then they all start relaxing and smoke weed by the lake um again i i think this is a great scene of people vibing it gives you more of a sense like you know them like even though spider seems like the weirdest dude he won't smoke weed and I just I feel like when you hang out with people, you just meet kind of weirdos who have these weird like, oh, I won't do that. Actually, it feels weirdly realistic. So while they're relaxing, Wendy tells the others that the lake is the same place where a murderer killed many people years earlier. Okay, whatever, Wendy. So Spider and Samantha leave the group for a bathroom break. Suddenly, though, Samantha stands up and is killed when a knife is launched into her face. And there's just this, there's no cheesy scream or anything. Samantha's just like, what, what, you know, it's just like, what has happened to me? Um, Spider attempts to run, but he's stabbed in the head repeatedly. This scene 
is scary. Like he kicks this, this thing kicks him to the ground and just like, you know, gets him. And the effect is so cool. Cause it's just this kind of like black glitchy shape that approaches them. Um, I love that. I've never seen that before. So yeah, they they have a featureless red head that's obscured by, you know, tracking errors. And it's known as the glitch, which is what it's called in the end credits. But the, back at the lake, Joey asks Wendy where Spider and Samantha went. And she answers that they left. And he goes, what? They just, they left? She goes, do you want to have sex? Uh, And Joey's like, uh, she's like, what? So you're saying you don't want to fuck me? And he's like, let's just, you know, hey. And, but Joey, you know, has a brain. And he's like, you know, you were being serious before when you're talking about the murders. You know, I, I remember, you know, this stuff happening around here. Wendy then reveals that she has been to the lake before where the murderer slaughtered all of her friends and she is the only survivor, which is cool because the whole, this whole time you're thinking, is she in on it? Like, what is she? Why is this here? She knows that the police did not believe her when she said that the killer could be in two places at once and tells Joey that she needed them um, to use as bait. So that she can find and kill the glitch. As they talk, that like she's talking with Joey, the camera facing Joey, and the glitch is just slowly coming up behind him and then slits his throat. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> Wendy then runs away, which I'm kind of like, okay, you lured him here and now you're just going to run away. But she lures him into a pit trap, then into a bear trap, and uh, it traps it momentarily. She tries filming it up close, but it continues to be obscured by the tracking errors and it slashes her hand. She then runs through the woods again, warning anyone who finds the tape never to come to the area. She finds Joey in his death throes and watches as he dies, which is kind of creepy. I didn't really understand why he would. He's just standing and walking around, um, but it mm -hmm. is creepy. Like, I don't understand why it would happen, but it's unsettling. Um, the glitch then approaches Wendy before a bed of spikes impales it she and now this is where i was like so how did she set all these up though if this thing is here that doesn't make any sense she yeah. goats or she gloats at the glitch and walks away but when she turns around it's gone it reappears in a tree pounces on wendy beats her to death with the camera and then slashes her stomach and this is you know gross too at the end there's this little effect where things are kind of sped up and creepy and like She's twitching and shuddering violently and her like intestines are growing everywhere. And then it's revealed she has become the glitch. Ooh. <laughs> I like this one. I like yeah, it. It's not bad. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, and I feel like with the series, there are, there are, um, I mean, you know, I guess with any anthology, you're going to have like an uneven, you know, some, some are going to be better than others. Yeah. Um, but there are some really cool ideas. Like, and I think it's in the most recent one is the, the girl in the, in the coffin. Yeah. In New Orleans or something. Um, mm -hmm. and there's also the one where they go actually go to hell. Yes. Um, it, it, that I like crazy. that one a lot. But then I think there's one in the second one where everybody becomes zombies. I love that one. It's from the viewpoint it's of the favorite. zombie. Yeah. Yeah. It's my, maybe my all time favorite. So there is a lot of creativity that's in this series. And I would say this is, yeah, this is probably the best one so far. Yeah. In, in this, in this, uh, in this anthology. Yeah. I, I like this one a it's lot. It's pretty solid. Yeah. Acting's not great, but you know, who cares? You know, a <laughs> lot of horror movies struggle with that. Yeah. So back to tape 56. The old man's body has returned to the room, but Rox is nowhere to be seen. The remaining criminals, Zack and Gary, are confused as to where the others have gone, with Gary then telling Zack to look through the tapes. Why? Why? Okay, it's because we need a ba backdrop, I guess. All right. Let's do the next one. Here, it, you know, I'm conflicted about this one. I like I, this one. I, I like it, um, but I just, there's so many parts where I'm like, did we need to see those boobs? I don't think we did. No, there's two but... there's literally a scene of a woman shaking her boobs into the camera why did we need this this one would be so much better without this okay this one's called the sick thing that happened to emily when she was younger directed by joe swanberg written by 
Simon Barrett. Hey, you showed up again. This is told entirely through a series of computer video chats. I love these kinds of found footage. It's it's a cute method. There's this girl, Emily. I, okay, no offense to this person. It also made me feel creepy that we saw her boobs because she looks so young. She's got a face that looks so young. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm, yeah. she just looked like a child. And then I have to see her boobs. I'm like, oh, you know, because I, I feel like you could. They made her look young. And then they made us look at her boobs. It made me feel weird. She's chatting with her boyfriend, James, who is an aspiring doctor, about a strange bump on her arm. And it reminds her of an accident she had when she was younger. Um, They're kind of, they're they're doing long distance. And she's showing him around her apartment with the thing. And then she's also like, yeah, I think it's haunted. She's very cavalier about it being haunted. <laughs> <laughs> she's like yeah i keep hearing footsteps and noises i just closed my door but let's figure out what it is um so so she and uh, yeah and uh it does this happen in the beginning i feel like there's just a part in the beginning where he's like you know take off your shirt and yeah. she does and it's just like wh- there's no point except for oh wouldn't it be cool to look at boobs i love boobs <laughs> um go go fuck a woman okay with her consent all these guys were too horny making this movie or watch some porn i don't know they should probably watch less porn it's probably why they're like this okay (laughs) i'm angry you know it's so interesting just sidebar um whatever it's called sexual morality i don't know this unit i do in my ethics class um i ask my students about pornography and they're really in favor of only fans but they're yeah. really not in favor of pornography. Like they are anti-pornography, like to a degree that I haven't That's awesome. seen like in many years. But they're like, oh no, it's bad, Miss Hare is really bad. So That's I don't great. Know. Yeah. They're they're very this this I don't know, I would say teenagers to early twenties kids in you know, in my classes are really anti porn. I mean I feel like out of any generation, it or every new generation is getting more and more inundated with it. And that's scary. I yeah. was inundated with it. It was unavoidable. Like you get banner. I've gotten banner ads on YouTube, a child friendly site of like straight up like cartoon porn. Like it, press this and it, like her boobies are just jiggling. And I'm like, this is a child friendly quote web- website what is going on here and porn itself is becoming more and more extreme like so extreme um and I, it's so that makes me so that makes me happy that people are in favor of women having empowerment i mean men too there's also men on only um having empowerment and you know getting the money back for the work that they're doing because it's work um and not you know things being reposted 10 million times of a woman being abused that's that's awesome that makes me very happy um and hopeful (laughs) for the future um okay so she shows james around investigates the room and witnesses a small ghostly childlike entity rush into her room and slam the door shut which leads her to believe it's haunted. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And I like this scene because it comes in and she immediately just like screams and like puts her hands over her eyes and then it slams the door shut. I felt like that was, that'd be pretty realistic if something came in. You'd probably just be like, let me pretend this isn't happening. Hearing the noises again the next night, Emily attempts to investigate some more, only to discover the entity again when she turns on the light. She questions her landlord about the disturbances because, hey, he needs to tell her if something went wrong. But he claims that no children have ever lived in the apartment complex, nor have any people ever died there. But she's unconvinced. And this weird bruise and bump is just getting bigger. I love this part. <laughs> Me too. It's so crazy. During the next video chat with James, as she's talking, we see her working on her arm or something, and she nonchalantly brings up her arm and she's been digging at it with a scalpel with tweezers with a meat fork and he's trying to get her to stop and she's like no 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 it's just in here i feel it i just have to grab it um and she seems like a crazy person you know it seems like she's got some 
you know, that, that, uh, I don't remember what it is, but, you know, when people think that there's bugs crawling inside of them, you know, it, and she just is so confident that it's there. And he's so like, oh my God, please stop. Um, that's one of the freakiest parts. I and mean, she has gross. a substantial, like, it's like huge disc, like cut out of her own arm. And before when she was, she was showing him, there is, you know, a noticeable bump on the side of her arm and she's pushing the, the like disc or whatever that's under her skin and you can see it moving around and it's Ugh, so it's creepy. real gross and creepy and nasty he james urges her to stop before the womb becomes infected and he promises to check it out himself when he arrives in a week suspiciously he does not tell her to go to the hospital which i thought was right. a good detail he's like you yes. know just put it wrap it i'll check it out a normal person would be like you need to get help right now because that thing yeah. will get infected. So the next night, Emily attempts to contact the strange child. I like this. She closes her eyes and she's like, you look out for me and holds yeah. the camera out. <laughs> I thought this was great. The ghostly child appears again, along with a similarly ghostly young girl. The children then knock her unconscious. And then immediately we see James actually enter the apartment from, you know, Emily's view. Um, and James then surgically removes an alien fetus from Emily's torso, revealing that they are using Emily as an incubator for alien-human hybrids. James, who's been working with the aliens and removing the fetuses for some time, questions the aliens how much longer they plan to do this to Emily, because he worries that she may not survive much more of it, and mentions to them that the arm bump is a tracking device. The aliens erase Emily's memory again, while James breaks some of her bones to make it look like an accident Again. here's my big question how yeah. was he in her apartment without her knowing like where was he and how did well, she not been, hear him he could have been next door i mean i don't think he necessarily was like in her apartment i thought that detail was a little bit weird because he's there so fast like he yeah, gets in there, there very fast it's like he's in the bathroom and then he runs yeah. over <laughs> you know it should have taken a little bit more time <laughs> yeah that's true and they don't look like aliens they do look like ghosts what's the deal with that yeah yeah that's true but i like some ideas like again the ideas i like are the good. idea conversely the man is the villain in this one that's true i would agree all all the men are villains in some way in this you know but i mean she's she's a complete innocent yeah i mean there's no she has no villainy in her whatsoever yeah she's and she's a complete victim which is i mean not great either you know but yeah in their next chat a badly injured emily believes she sustained her injuries after wandering into traffic in a fugue state she reveals that the doctor james recommended has diagnosed her as schizoaffective and tearfully says that james deserves a better more normal girlfriend he assures <laughs> emily that she's the only person he wants to be with but then once their chat ends he begins to chat with a different woman. This is the woman who immediately strips and l quite literally puts her breasts up to the camera and shakes them. Um, why? She's got the same bump on her arm, also believes that James is her boyfriend, revealing that the aliens are using multiple people as incubators. I mean, the thing that I like about this one is that Emily... <laughs> to say she's being gaslit is a severe understatement. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's <laughs> it's like so much worse than yeah. she could ever imagine. So it's not just that he's two timing her or three or four or five timing her. It, you know, it's not that she believes that she's not good enough for him. It's that she's fucking being used as an incubator for these alien fetuses. I mean, that's like yeah so crazy um and i love that i mean i like it when horror is like oh you thought this was bad yeah but it's worse it's so much worse yeah making somebody believe they're crazy is the scariest thing i can think of that's just yeah it's torture it is we have literal to watch, torture we have to watch the the gaslight like the mm. you know the old movie mm -hmm. um because it's so simple mm -hmm. but it's horrifying so now, uh, back to tape 56. 
Zach and the old man's corpse are gone. Gary, now the only one left, searches the room upstairs. He finds the decapitated remains of Zach and is subsequently attacked by the old man, who's become a zombie, of course. Gary attempts to flee downstairs, but he falls and what twists his ankle? Okay, great. And is killed by the zombie. The frame story ends with the camera left in the TV room, picking up the sound of the VCR starting the last tape by itself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like this one too. This I last like this one. one too. Yeah. I like it. We got boys having fun without being creepy. And these boys are actually chivalrous. A welcome change to the story. So this last one, uh, October 31st, 1998, was directed by Radio Silence and written by Radio Silence. On Halloween night, 1998, Tyler, dressed as a teddy bear, implanted with a nanny cam, meets his friends Chad, Matt, and Paul, who are dressed as the Unabomber, a pirate, and a Marine, respectively. And this is so cute. Like, he he asks his roommate, like, hey, you want to come with? Roommate's like, aren't you a little bit old to be doing that? And he's like, ha, whatever. Goes and hangs out with his friends. He's the nanny cam, but they're not using it to uh, hurt women. It's just to be like, we're going to have a crazy night. Like, I want to film it. I'm with my bros. And they're just having fun. They're singing a song in the car. This is wholesome. They head to a mm -hmm. Halloween party at a friend's house, only to end up at the wrong place. Now, first off, this is a bit unrealistic. Why Why did they stay? Like, there's clearly no party here, and yet th they stay. But anyways, it's a horror movie. They sneak inside. They begin to experience some paranormal phenomena, but they believe that they're at a super realistic haunted house attraction and have fun with it. My favorite being, we don't see it at first, but I do love this is one guy, like two guys come out of a room and they're like, oh, that was crazy. There were like hands coming out of the wall and they're just like, whoa, that's wild. And the audience is like, what the fuck? <laughs> but I love that we don't see it. Like we don't yeah. see that yet. And you're like, uh, uh oh, <laughs> this can't be good. <laughs> they keep exploring, you know, they're, they're drinking beers, having fun. When they go up to the attic, they find several men gathered with a young woman whom they have suspended from the rafters, apparently performing an exorcism. The men are chanting, cast you down towards the woman who is like screaming like, please help. But they honestly, this is a kind of, you know, it could be a haunted house thing. So they all join in. <laughs> Again, a welcome change. The woman is not, uh, you know, has not been stripped. She has all her clothes on. Um, they join into like cast you down. You know? <laughs> the people turn around and they're like, "What the fuck are you doing here?" And they're like, "Oh, well, we're just here for the party." They're like, "Get the fuck out!" Um, so they also begin to assault the young woman, um, which causes some of the men to be pulled upwards by the darkness into an unseen force. Like they just get who pulled up and. More violent, overtly threatening paranormal phenomena then begin to occur as the boys initially flee, like we see the hands coming out. But then uh, Tyler, re he's like, guys, we can't leave. We have to help her. Amazing. Um, <laughs> so they go back upstairs. They're total badasses. Um, they fight off the guys. They work to untie her and get her to safety. Like they're all carrying her out. They're like, we need to get her to a hospital. Um when when she's freed, the house then comes to life with the phenomena. Oh, excuse me. I misspoke. That's when the ghostly arms rise from the walls and the floors uh, to claim the lives of the woman's captors. <laughs> they exit through the basement and pile into their car with the girl and drive away. The car then abruptly stops, though, and the girl disappears, reappearing in the street before them and screaming and then walking away amid a flock of birds. Then they realize that the car has stopped on train tracks and that the girl they rescued is wah, wah, actually a witch. They attempt to get out of the car as a train approaches, but the car won't unlock or start and the train smashes into the car off camera, killing all inside. Scary. During the mm -hmm. end credits, clips from tape 56 are shown. Awesome. That was VHS. <laughs> Again, I do not remember feeling this way about it when i first watched it but wow i certainly um <laughs> again there there are some good things but you gotta wonder are these good because the other ones are so bad 
or are they actually good? <laughs> like, are they good by comparison? I mean, I feel like that. I mean, I don't. I think the frame story is just real, just real dumb, and I don't get. Uh, the guy turns into a zombie. Like, how does that even happen? But you know, whatever. But I think every story has elements that have good ideas in it. It's mm-hmm. just that the execution, especially in the first two, is real bad. And you know, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know when I saw this the first time. I, I didn't. Obviously, I didn't see it as a teenager like he did. But you know. There, it's, like you said, is this is a whole lot more rapey than I remember. Unfortunate. Here's some trivia. The brick house the three guys break into where all the VHS tapes are located is the same house from Marble Hornets. Interesting. Which is a found footage web series on YouTube that popularized Slenderman. The word fuck is said around 240 times. Whoa, these guys must love South Park. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sam and Stephanie's fortune card from the machine and second honeymoon alludes to other arcs of the anthology as well as its own arc. Other arcs too? Wait a minute. You're going to be reunited with a loved one? That's the that's theirs. Cuz she's with- And what else that you're like Oh, Emily, I mean, you you trust too easily. Ah. Um, but that could also be her boyfriend or her husband. Yeah. I don't know. Well, what does Letterboxd have to say about it? Worm Jr. gave it five stars and said, Boobs the movie. But seriously, one of the most creative found footage films I've ever seen. You need to watch more. Yeah, you do. (laughs) Riley gave it five stars. This shit is red hot. Prepare for awesome. All right. Is that a quote from the movie? I don't know. I think it is. It could. It Probably. Space Ghost 08 gave it five stars and said, goaded. Gotta disagree, Space Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Fanny Pack in Heat gave it five stars and said, they didn't even rewind the tapes at the end. That's the scariest part. <laughs> at least... <laughs> Lee Summers gave it five stars, said, it's on Hulu right now. Skip to 4150 to watch Safe Haven which is directed by Gareth Evans, who directed... Wait, this is the second... Oh, I know. <laughs> who directed I mean, arguably the second... The two best I... action fighting movies of the past 10 to 15 years, The Raid and The Raid 2. <laughs> Safe Haven is fucking wild. It's the craziest 20-something minutes you'll ever see. Actually, this is in VHS 2, but it is still on Hulu. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty good. I think, I think I do. it's... That's a standout. Yeah. Popper <laughs> Addict... Gave it five stars and said the Whoa. succubus is such a queen. I guess. I guess. Dr. Neverland gave it five stars. A nifty anthology of horror stories with an overall, quote, overplot that connects them together. An eclectic mix of supernatural horror, science fiction, urban legends, and old-fashioned ghost stories. Worth the watch if you don't mind the found footage format. <laughs> That's a big Isn't part it? of it. <laughs> If you don't like the point of the movie, (laughs) even if you don't like the movie, watch it. What? (laughs) Now, here's my people. (laughs) Belia Garcia gave it a half star. Too many unjustified tits. Too much crackling noises. Not enough vampire killers. Fair. Okay. (laughs) Okay, Belia. (laughs) <laughs> Harry Joe 24 give it a half star ass <laughs> yep oh my god is this me Jelsamina gave it a half star and said I used to adore this film as a teenager but as you can tell that has changed the core of that change I believe is age I say at the ripe young age of 26 is this me this film is the embodiment of dumbness and nothing within this film makes sense from the hollow stories, cringe caricatures, and acting and conflicting camera work, VHS, in my opinion, is a frustrating waste of time. Nice. <laughs> Black Thembo gave it a half star. Feels weirdly misogynistic and also so weird that one character insists on using the N-word all the time. <laughs> when did that happen? I don't know. I was going to ask you, is it in the... It's probably in the over... over 
did, plot over the Did frame. that happen? I mean, I believe... I I believe I was going to ask you because I couldn't remember. But I mean, yeah, I I don't remember that. But again, I it w- it would not surprise me. Right. Angsty Peep gave it a half star. Found footage of me eating a pizza while scrolling through my phone from how bored I was. Cathword <laughs> 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 twenty six gave it a half star. Men shouldn't be allowed to make found footage movies anymore. I, you know, let's let's give other people a chance. I will say, you know, hey, men, th- they might have ruined this one for you. Let's give somebody else a shot. <laughs> okay, just we didn't plan this, but can you think of some found footage movies that are better than this one? I'll go first. Cloverfield. Yeah, Cloverfield. I like Paranormal Activity. No, not Paranormal. Excuse me. Grave Encounters. I like that movie. Oh, yeah. Ganjam Haunted Asylum. Yes. Sacrament. Yes. The second the second VHS has better ones than this one. VHS 2. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can't think of any. Uh, I know I, I know I like other ones, too. But That's those a are good the list. I, can think of. I mean, yeah. if you... If you, I mean, before we started this podcast, I hadn't seen, I don't think any of them besides this one. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you are interested in found footage films, I, Ganjam Haunted Asylum is probably my favorite. Yeah, um, same. I think they do really great things with the genre. Me too. Do you want to go through the questions? We have a, I'll, so I'll, could, I'll run through real quick. Okay. Rating half star. What have we learned? Whoa. Don't watch this movie. <laughs> Would we watch it again? Absolutely not. Who wins the Ufool Award? Me for watching it. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite scene, death, the credits. Wow. Yeah. I'm I, I mean, am I, sorry I, for suggesting this. No, 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 no. I mean, it is, I think it is considered sort of a foundational film in this genre so i i don't mind you know looking at it um for the podcast um i think two is better i don't think they get consistently better (laughs) i think they went up and then it went boo but not for the (laughs) same reasons as why vhs one is bad i actually think they get a lot more boring and just kind of like i mean this one i think you could also argue is boring but I think three, four, is there a fifth? I've watched all of them. They... There's 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 VHS, VHS, VHS 2, VHS 94, VHS Viral. Ah. And then VHS 99? Yes. <laughs> Max Cat really wants um, some attention or something. She keeps pawing there at him. Go. It's really adorable. <laughs> Does she have stairs down from your desk? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's so cute. (laughs) She's got old bones. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Should we should we get into the three extremes too? Let's do it. Okay. (laughs) This will be a much shorter part of the podcast. Three Extremes 2 was directed by Kim Ji-un, Nonzi Nimabitter, and Peter Ho-sun Chan. Peter Ho-sun Chan. Written by Joju Hui, Kim Ji-un, and Nitas Sigamat. The cinematography is by Hong Kyung Pyo, Nata Wut Kita Hyun, and Christopher Doyle. Edited by Nonzi Nim- Nimabitter, Chung Yun Chul and Kong Chi Lung. The release date was July 12, 2002. It has a running time of 129 minutes. Okay, this is a an anthology. It has three stories. We talked about the first one when we did our spotlight on Kim Ji Woon. And so I'll just briefly go over the plot and we could talk about maybe what we liked or didn't like about the stories. Um, this I looked one, it up. yeah. Nanzi Nimibuter. Nanzi Nimibuter. 
That's what howtopronounce.com says. Okay. So the first one's called Memories. It's about a man. It was about a man and a woman. The man is seemingly being haunted and he doesn't understand where his wife has gone. She has disappeared. He thinks that something terrible has happened to her, but he's not sure what. And the woman, when we first see her, it looks like she has fallen to her death outside um, of a building of a high rise except there's no blood or anything. And it turns out, no, she's just unconscious and she's disoriented and she is not able to be sensed apparently by anybody else in town. So she goes into a coffee shop. Nobody waits on her. She goes into a cab. The cab driver ignores her. And so um, if you've seen any horror at all, you would probably suspect pretty much from jump that she is a ghost and she is a ghost. The woman, when she wakes up, all she has is her wallet and her phone and a dry cleaning receipt, which has her phone number, home phone number and her address on it. And she finds her home. And when she goes home, she walks up to her husband and she starts twirling her hair. But as she's twirling her hair, she's actually drilling with her finger into her skull. And when she pulls it out, just like viscera and blood just like pour down her dress. And that's a hallucination of his. But when she realizes her fate, it's a really cool effect. Like she's on this, like this, I don't know what it's called. I'm not a filmmaker, but it's some kind of platform that moves so that when and it's in the cameras on her face so that when she moves, it's a very like it's not a human type movement. It's just this very strange thing. And she falls back when she finds her own body in pieces in a duffel bag on the floor. Which is the scene where it's like she's looking in the mirror and like fingers oh, yeah. just like come. That's come a good off. one. Yeah, she goes. Yeah, she goes into sort of like a rest stop bathroom and she's um, just washing her hands or whatever. And then behind her stuff starts to fall. And then the sink is filling with water and then things are dropping into the sink and they're severed fingers. That's a great that's a great part, too. So the man zips up the, the duffel bag and he drives away from the development, which has a banner across it which is Newtown, colon, where dreams come true. And there's a flashback to their unhappy home life, and she was actually leaving him. And the very last shot is of of the husband, the wife, and their child, you know, seemingly in a happy uh, pose. But this was not that. This was a very unhappy marriage filled with abuse, and it ended in... Her violent death. Not good. <laughs> Mac your face. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't... So it, you know, it's not it's not great. I mean, we love Kim Ji Woon from from the Tale of Two Sisters, and and like his other movies are very atmospheric as well. But he gets away. I don't. I'm not always a big fan of atmospheric horror, but I think he does it well by making things so beautiful that you cannot take your eye away from it. So you don't mind that there's like a long stretch where it feels like nothing is happening. And then Mm -hmm. it makes it scarier when something really fucking scary happens. But in this one, I'm bored. You know, I'm kind of like, all right. I don't think it's visually interesting enough to justify the such. Cause like, again, like you said, you get it. It's like, she's dead. Okay. Um, Why do I have to watch another scene of this? And then when the horror starts, it's like, this is awesome. Um, And then, but at that point, I'm already like, I'm hoping this is over soon because I'm so bored. So maybe check out A Tale of Two Sisters or I Saw the Devil or even I Liked Quiet Family. I couldn't get you to watch it, but that's an early work of his. Oh, I thought you did watch it, but you did not like it. No, I think I liked it, didn't I? I don't know. I I thought I liked it. liking it. Well, anyway, let's not fight about it. (laughs) But for a while, 
uh, I Saw the Devil was Mac's favorite movie. It's still up there. The Handmaiden beat it, but it's probably like number two. Yeah, it's pretty darn good. Okay, the second one is called The Wheel, and this is by, what's that guy's name? Um, Nanazi. Nanzi. Say it again. <laughs> Nanzi Nibiniter. N- How to pronounce Nanzi Nimibiter. 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 Nanzi Nimibiter. Excellent. Okay, this one's called The Wheel, and we are told that there are people in Thailand who are of a high status, and they have these really elaborate puppets, and um, they're sort of like in the higher echelons of society, and they tell the stories of the people. And then there are people who live in abject poverty who wear masks and they perform on the street, and it's the same story. But these puppets are highly coveted, but there's a belief that the puppets all have a curse on them such that only the rightful owner should have them. So we're told all of that in the beginning on these on these cards, and then the story unfolds, and that's basically what happens. Um, a man um, wanted to drown his puppets because he thought they were cursed, but his wife and son ended up drowning instead. And then he was burned alive in his home. And then this other master decided that he wanted the puppets. And then he met a similar fate. Don't covet things that don't belong to you. And don't fuck around with cursed puppets yeah this one is a little bit hard to follow but i will say what it already has over memories is that i do think (laughs) it is really beautiful to look at Mm -hmm. like they the costumes and the dolls themselves and the setting is gorgeous and it like the the tale is very interesting i don't know much about you know these kinds of like beliefs and whatnot um and it's always really interesting and cool to learn. But the story is a little bit, that's not the highlight. The highlight is looking at everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I told Matt before we get started, I watched this three times because I could not follow it. It was pretty boring to me. Um, the acting is abysmal and the supernatural elements of this are not, are only sort of depicted by the reactions of the actors to them. And it's not good, you guys. So, yeah. um, yeah, this is generally considered to be the weakest one of the three. Then we get to my fave going. Yeah, this is the best going home directed by Peter Chan. So we have a widowed cop who moves into this dying apartment. And there's some cool, um, camera work right at the beginning when somebody opens the gate and the camera just kind of like it's like uh, can't one way and then all the way around to the other way there's some just really cool stuff going on so he moves in with his son Chung and he's a pretty strict guy and he has to leave his son alone for long stretches of time and the child is pretty scared of this new place and there's also a little silent girl in a red dress that the kid is is intrigued by but also frightened of and so he's told um chan is told that there is a neighbor right across the way you um who lives with his paralyzed wife higher and um daughter so um and that's the girl in the red dress the girl in the red dress yeah so the two little kids become friends and they play at a photo studio and a little while later Chan can't find his kid. And all that we see is that where we just saw a chalk drawing of the little girl on the side of a wall. Now we see a chalk drawing of the little girl and the little boy. Mm -hmm. And um, Chan thinks that, 
the neighbor, you, has kidnapped his son. So he attempts to break into the apartment. He's caught. He's tied up. Oh, I think something interesting before this is we see before Chan breaks in, like maybe we just get like a little vignette of you with his wife and he's bathing her in like this tub, like and and talking to her. And it's pretty sweet. Like, you know, he's just talking, I think, about when they met um, and uh, she does look very pale with like blue lips, but he's asking, you know, I think what should we get your parents or something when we see them? And she says chocolates. So mm -hmm. she's alive. Right. Right. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> but we, the audience. Think yeah, that. we. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it is very well directed because she's in this kind of when we first see her. Yeah, I think we think she's alive, although he's been cutting her hair for quite a while. There's all this all these like snippets of hair in the I bathtub. I love that, that that visual. Yeah, he's cutting her hair and talking about how she has split ends, which only you get when your hair keeps growing. Um, yeah. And the just the image of all the hair, like it's just. I don't know. He's doing his best. I feel like, you know, he's, this is a huge, it is a huge task caring for an entire body, you know, mm -hmm. all by yourself. And, um, but he's like lovingly cutting her hair. He's not just chopping it. He's trimming oh, like no. little pieces. Um, so yeah, he is devoted to her. So Chan breaks into the apartment and, um, is then taken hostage. Cause he sees, in the tub she's just in the like all the way lowered in the tub like now she looks like a corpse yeah and he you says yes that his wife has died but he believes that she is going to come back to life um and he's been treating her with traditional chinese herbs and um he's been caring for her and they're hoping that they can go back to the mainland this takes place in hong kong um and so they're hoping that they can go back uh, home he also tells chan that he never had a daughter because she was aborted when his wife succumbed to liver cancer three years before there there are a bunch of tactics that chan uses to you know try to get you to understand that his wife is dead and that he has to let him go um, and he's like, well, if you won't let me go, will you get me beer? And he, you know, he gets him beer. And um, I don't know. So it's it's kind of, I don't know. I like this one. I like I like the way that the cop is has a lot of sympathy for this guy. But he's also like, look, man, you have to face reality. Like your wife is dead. And he's at the same time, his son is missing. So he's like, please, like, let me go so I can look for him. And you know, Chan's like, I'll, you know, I'll let you go. Um, or no, you, you is like, I'll, I'll let you go in three days. And I love the beer scene. Cause he's like, yeah, go get me beer. And then when, uh, you is giving it to him, he's like, so do you talk to your wife? Does she ever talk back? And he's like, yeah, you know, I, I ask her things and, you know, we, we talk all the time and he says, really? So yeah, when, and, and you say you don't have my son. And he's like, no, I don't. He's like, that's not what your wife said. When you left, I asked her and he, she said that you kidnapped him. And you says, that's, that's preposterous. She can't talk. Well, but I love that. That's so clever, you know, yeah. like showing like, if, well, if I say she can, you know, and him immediately being like, no, of course she can't. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, so at one point, um, Chan's fellow cops come to the door and they say, have you seen this guy? And he's like, oh yeah. But he said that he went gambling. Um, he went to Macau to go gambling or something. And so the cops like, okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks for that. And, um, then Chan's like, you know what? Um, my colleagues know that I never gamble. So then the, house is sort of like raided by all the other cops and, and this is the day where she's supposed to revive and he's right. kind of desperate use kind of desperately like 
okay, like, you know, wake up now, but she won't. And he's made her up. He's put makeup all over her face and um, he's, he's just, yeah, he's just um, been anticipating. This is three years to the day of her death. So he thinks it's going to be the resurrection day for her. And um, so he, he uh, escapes. um, Well, no. So, so the cops bust in, they take out the wife's body and put her like in a, in a truck in like a coroner's truck or something. And then you escapes and he tries to run to the truck where she's being held and he is hit by a car and he's killed. Then the doctor who treated you and Hi-er, um tells Chan the full truth about her patients, as well as the fact that um, though Hi-er has died, she does show, so sh- she does show signs of life. Like her hair is growing, her fingernails are growing. And we learned that three years before Hi-er's diagnosis, you was also diagnosed with lung cancer, with liver cancer. And as I understand it, he died. Yeah. And she, and she resurrected him. him. And then she died. And now he's attempting to resurrect her. But if he is uh, thwarted in that because he's killed by by the car. Well, the the video where she's explaining this is so beautiful. Like she just has this really long monologue where she's saying like, people say that, you know, a woman who's independent is less happy than a woman who's sick because she has somebody to take care of her. And, you know, and she's basically saying how hard it was to take care of him. But you know, how this must be the gods, you know, testing them and to, to prove their love to each other. And she's like, so please don't let my soul leave my body. Like, please take care of me. Um, and then it shows clips of her taking care of him while he's obviously dead. And the cops watching this and just looks like so sad. You know, it's such a bummer. But the whole question I have is like, I think that story is so great. And I think that is done so well. But I don't, I don't, I feel like the part with his son is just kind of thrown in there, you know, same thing with the aborted daughter. Like, what is the point of that? Well, I think when Chan is with you, they're both sort of demonstrating to each other that they have a love of their life. Like for Chan, it's his son. And for you, it's higher. And I, I think I, you know, I don't know a lot about Chinese culture, but this does take place in Hong Kong. And there's a difference between Hong Kongers and mainlanders. And uh, I don't know. I think they're trying to, and also this man is a, is he a doctor himself? Yeah, he is. Yeah. Versus cop with like blue collar versus like, I don't know, somebody in the medical profession. So I think there are all these dichotomies. So I don't, I don't know any deeper than that. Um, and then at the end, we're, I think we're supposed to assume that the child is dead and that that photo studio is sort of like a purgatory or just sort mm. of a waiting area for the, for the afterlife or something. But the kid is definitely dead. So Chan has lost someone and, you know, this love has also been lost, you know, because, because people obviously assumed that the man was crazy and Mm. no one would have ever considered that this, what he was saying was actually true. Mm. Um, But beyond that, I'm not sure. I, I I think it's a beautiful film and I think it's worth it. I, I think, I think, I don't know if this redeems the whole thing, but this is definitely the best. You can just skip to this part. You could just skip to this one, honestly. <laughs> but I would watch it. I think it's really yeah. cool. And I would love to hear from Wohos who have like deeper insight into the story because I I don't and um uh, I would like to know more. But uh Mac, what phobia is that? I have three phobias this week. Ooh. Pupophobia? What is that? Uh that's a fear of balloons. Huh. But There's a balloon lobophobia? in memories. Same thing. Oh. Uh, globophobia is also a fear of balloons. But there is a balloon 
which I think is pretty cheesy in memories. Yeah. There's like a balloon and a, and a baby doll like in his apartment. And there's also necrophobia, which is a fear of corpses or dead things. I think I have a healthy fear, like it really grow like it's unsettling to me. Like even I did find like a, a dead, like, gerbil thing i mean it probably was it wasn't the mouse in my house because this was like months ago but it was just i bet just like an animal or like a hawk killed it or something and i don't know it just is like just freaks me out looking at like a hollow thing yeah it just is weird and unsettling i think that's the perfect word for it i find it very unsettling yeah there's a, only one piece of trivia I found, which was that it was released in America as three dot 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 extremes two, but actually um, this one was the first one. Interesting. But three extremes did pretty well, and so to capitalize on that, they called it three extremes two. What does Letterboxd have to say about it? Quasi gave it five stars. Memories. Fairly interesting short film with some scary parts. Keeps you on the edge of your seat. The wheel. I wasn't really feeling this one for some reason. It wasn't bad. I just wasn't into it. (laughs) Going home. The standout short of the bunch. Incredible story that is intriguing and unique. Awesome editing. Great acting. Good cinematography. 10 out of 10 for this one alone. Mega Them gave it four and a half stars. The monologue at the end of Going Home is one of the greatest ever. I agree. Stephanie gave it four stars. Well, now I'm sad. Jen gave it three and a half stars. Ghost girls, cursed puppets, creepy kids, and questionable medical practices. The placement of the shorts in this anthology is pretty smart. The first is good, and the third is great. Brandon Gomez gave it one star, a.k.a. Three Extremes Two on via Tubi. This was effing garbage, at least with Three Extremes at Something Happens in that, but here, nothing at all, except for the first story, Don't Even Bother with This Trash, two hours, two, T-O, long. Damn. Damn, Brandon. (laughs) Mac in... Mackie NJ gave it one and a half stars. A fucking dull snoozer of a horror anthology. <laughs> Creepy imagery in one of them, the first one, at times, but this is so complex and annoying. Floating G Bean third Floating G Bean gave it one and a half stars. Memories, two out of five. The wheel, one out of five. Going home, two out of five. I would love to see going home remade. It's a pretty good concept. I think it stands alone on its own. I don't think it needs I to think be remade. I, I would. I. I think it was released all by itself. Oh. Um. And I think you um, get a four minute long version, four minute longer version on the DVD. Hmm. I read that somewhere. How would we rate this? Um. Should we rate each one? Okay. First one, um, maybe like three out of five fingers. <laughs> Second one, one out of five puppets. Last one, four out of five herbs. Love it. <laughs> I can't. I can't disagree. Would we watch it again? I would watch the last one again. Yeah, I would watch the last one again. Maybe I'd watch the ending of Memories again. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, who wins the You Fool Award? I guess. Well, in the first one, the 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 husband. Second one, us for watching. Well, us for watching, and the last one, <clears throat> I guess Chan. Yeah, because he also didn't really keep a good eye on his son, unfortunately, which maybe had something to do with his demise. Yeah, it's unclear, but probably. Yeah, he didn't really listen to him when he said he was scared. He just said, be a man. No, yeah, that sucked a lot. I did not like that at all. All right, Mac, we did it. We did it. I wasn't sure how we were going to do this one, but I think we did pretty good.
Thank you for joining us on this episode and for all your support. It means the world of horror to us, truly. So we originally were going to do our take on possession with the exorcist and the wailing, and we will, woe but we thought it might be kind of fun since we just talked about um, VHS to look at Your Next from the U.S. and Tenebrae from Italy, a movie I've been wanting to look at for some time now. We would welcome your support in the form of a five-star review or thumbs up on your preferred listening platform, but we will settle for you just telling all your friends all about us. On that, shout out to our Wohos in various area codes. The last episode was downloaded in U.S., Germany, Canada, India, and Thailand. If you'd like a specific shout out, please get in touch. Mac, what do you have going on? Well, as always, you can follow me on Twitch, Tumblr, and Instagram at Macaritaville. Remember, Wohos, we love you. And don't go into the basement. <laughs>